Hello and good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the second installment of our three part inspirational small talk series where we ask you to pause over lunch and to listen to a collection of stories about projects continuing during lockdown. I'm Kirsty Bustichio, your RIBA Bristol and Bath Chair and I'll be your host for today. So we kicked off this series on Tuesday by welcoming Principal and Head of the BDP Bristol Studio, Nick Ferrum. He talked to us about the Nightingale hospitals designed to keep and help the NHS deal with the impact of COVID-19 patients. Today though we'll be turning our focus to the education sector and invite here attorney from AHR to tell us all about a project AHR has started working on before the lockdown at UE Bristol University. Uh, before we kick off, I do have a few tips and uh, notes about housekeeping. Uh, you will all be muted uh, now that you've joined the event. If you do want to ask a question, please do so in the Q&A and please indicate who you are. If you don't, um, well, if we don't have time to answer all of the questions, we will respond to you after the event. So please, if you could leave your email, that would be great. And just a note that this event is also recorded. I'd also like to remind you of our third and final talk next Tuesday, the 26th of May, where we'll see Tony Mullins from Oxford Architects. He'll present plans to develop the site of one of Bristol's most recognised hotspots, well, night spots rather, and that's the Lakota. Run by the Burgess family for over 30 years, it was finally time to move on and sell up, so tune in to find out some more. All of these talks are available for ROBA members only, so please do check out the architecture.com website to become a member. Okay, so we're now finally ready to introduce our second speaker of the series. Uh, with us today, we have Associate Director here, Attorney from AHR. She's actually been practicing at AHR for 15 years now here in Bristol. She studied her part three at UWE and even involved herself year on year in the RIBA mentoring program at UWE also. So I can imagine uh, it's a real mix of excitement and possibly pressure of undertaking a design for a UWE building at what is essentially your stomping ground. So uh, what Hira will do today is give us a count of the new engineering building and she'll be reflecting on where they got to before the lockdown, what the effect of the lockdown has meant to the project and where they are now. So I will pass you over to Hira and I look forward to the presentation. Hi, I hope everyone can hear me OK. Uh, my name's Hera, as Kirsty said, from AHR, and I'm having to talk to you today about the UE Engineering building that we're currently working on on the French A campus site. Oh, hello. OK, so that's me on the far right there, and this was very early doors on the project when the steel frame was up, the structure's up, you can see the glue lamp here, and some of the slab was in. So who are we? AHR, we're architects and master planners. We're the 10th largest UK practice. We've won the Southwest Architecture Practice of the Year Award, uh, the Insider one in 2018 and 19. We're a multi-sector and multi-region with eight offices across the UK, including here in Bristol, where I'm based. So a flavour of some of our work is the Canesham Civic Centre, uh, which was an RIBA winner and a BCO best of the best. The UK, UK Hydrographics Office, which is based down in Taunton, which we were actually having a chat before, which is some of the RIBA members have been to visit previously. Places Leisure Eastley, which is a new build leisure centre, has been open for about a year now. It's down near Southampton. It was an RIBA winner and the South Awards last year. Some of the other higher educational projects we've worked on, the Barbara Hepworth in Huddersfield, 4ES at University of Bath and the Impact Building in Swansea University. So the UE Engineering design is 8,000 square metre building, main, primarily constitutes the main building with an ancillary building for plant. The main building is made up of heavy duty workshops, labs and some medium duty, duty work spaces as well as teaching studios. These make up project spaces and making spaces with the idea of being able to create, test different ideas that are created as part of the engineering process. So it's about looking for engineering for the future adaptability because it's changing all the time the requirements for the faculty and also for the industry. 
The aim is for the building to be completed and fitted out ready for the start of the 2020 academic year. So a little bit about the background and design of the building is it's located, as mentioned, on the French A campus. We have the Faculty of the Business and Law, which is to the north of our site, student accommodation to the south and the existing library building over to the east. So it essentially is an island site where it can be seen from all four sides. So it's highly visible. So we were looking at a building that could be accessed and be seen from all of these sides. But we also wanted to create viewing uh, angles where you can so we've splayed back the building to allow sight through sight lines through to the existing FBL building, as well as keeping the heart space in here and connecting with a new plaza area that we're creating. There's a lot of workshops, as I mentioned earlier, heavy duty ones. So things like you've got manual workshops, automotive workshops, uh, concrete, where you've got things like a strong wall and you're trying to test and break items. And these are highly serviced as well as needing a lot of deliveries and different access to them. So they all need to be located on the ground floor, but also want to have a good presence so you can understand engineering, you know, having this showcase and frontage. So it's about having a highly glazed facade as well into them. So you've got all these workshops that need to be on the bottom of the building, which is a large amount of the accommodation. And then you also have other areas that need to go on top and can be further up the building. But you end up sort of with this pyramid structure, which is not really ideal for getting light into the building, also for connectivity. So we talked about it becoming like this, almost like a jelly mold. You take this and you flip it over. And that is what then results in our building's uh, format, which gives you this atrium space, which allows a lot of natural light to drop down in, cross-discipline visibility, which is one of the key aspects for the faculty, and a variety of learning environments for different people to be able to address it as and when they need. So there's a little snapshot up through the building. This is taken from uh, some images we did earlier in the project. So levels one and two is the ground floor. It's a split ground floor. So you can see this plaza area that I mentioned earlier, which has the connections onto the rest of the campus. You can see the materials starting to build up around the external with the core tan and which is you've got that sort of rusty older idea of engineering contrasting with this new shiny idea of the um, high gloss aluminium. So you're sort of trying to bring this backwards and forwards of different types of engineering, which is then balanced with some mesh as well to break up the facade. So this is cut back into the core tan block of the large envelope. You have the atrium in the middle of the space which as you can see, gets more open as it staggers up through. Oops, we lost the floor on the way. There we go. So you can see it staggers and it steps back to allow light to drop into all of the spaces at the lower level. Up on the top, you can see the north lights, which are along here. And on the backs of them, we have the PV panels as well. So where do we get to before? Apologise, everyone. There we go. Where did we get to before lockdown? So these photos were taken about the end of March. So as you can see, we were in a fortunate position. The building was pretty much weather tight. All the windows were installed and the cladding was about a third complete. So you can see there's still a lot of works that could be done on the external of the building. And the inside was progressing as well. It's um, you can see there's some of it done, but there's still quite a bit of work to be done in the spaces. So what's the impact of COVID-19 on this project? Like a lot of other practices, AHR, we're working from home. So we were in a fortunate position that we have issued all of our design team packages, so that was complete. So we were focusing on, or are still focusing on, sorry, site queries and coordination of subcontractor packages. So it's been a lot of virtual meetings, so Teams, uh, Skype, a lot of screen sharing, which I suspect a lot of other people are doing, as well as a lot of designing by snapshot. <laughs> so trying to draw things, especially during a meeting when you want to talk about something, something you would normally do in a, in a round table situation where you want to point, you want to describe something and you want to just debate how something may work or might be a better way of progressing with it. So one of the big challenges we've had is about um, furloughed or non-working consultants and subcontractors, particularly if we've been in the midst of review, reviewing or resolving an issue or an ongoing item, and then the person you've been dealing with has been furloughed or their company's been temporarily closed. This is where we found that keeping a record of decisions made and agreed between different parties has been key and keeping track of all those decisions and who was part of it to be able to pass on to any other people who become involved in the process. So how has this had an impact on the construction? 
uh, site was actually closed temporarily, but thankfully only for three days. They managed to reopen the site and site personnel numbers were low at first as people took a while to adapt to the new normal way of working, though they've since returned to almost the same numbers as pre-COVID. BAM, the, who's the main contractor, has introduced a one-way system on site to reduce overlapping of site personnel. This has allowed social distancing. We're very fortunate in that the building lends itself to this really well. We have two stair cores and they're in opposing corners of the building. And one of them's um, solely designated up, whereas the other is down. So it means that people can go around there and the atrium provides a natural circular movement pattern. Though it does get your daily step count up when you realize you've forgotten something on the other side of the atrium and you have to do another lap all the way back around again. The other impacts been on things like the procurement and the su supply chain. So having subcontractors stopping work or unable to procure materials has been a frustration for the main contractor and the design team. The unknown factor of when works will continue again and how to program around it has made things sometimes a bit awkward to understand how to take things forward. But some other things like, for example, the cladding has was stopped for a significant period on site. You can see in the photo on the right hand side where the curtain on the left hand side was installed quite early in the project and then we have partial installation on the right there. So there was concerns about the weathering of the curtain during the delays and different patina levels. However, the patina is anticipated to even out over time, it was always reach a certain level and stop at that point. We've had other items where the specialist um, automotive company are providing the um, high acoustic and impact resistance screens to the engine test cells. Whilst they're able to procure the, they get the design of the screens, they're unable actually currently to procure the glass, so they can't tell BAM then when they'll be able to deliver to site. So whilst we can give our input on that, we don't actually know when it's going to turn up on site. Some of these things are being a bit more resolved now as some of the factories are starting to reopen and the companies are moving forward as well. So what's, has there been any impact on the design? There has been some items that we're looking at and how because of the impact of the procurement. For example, one item is the an internal feature lining. So we're looking at how we could change it potentially from a bespoke specialist product to a more off the shelf product as the initial company is now unable to procure the material and their design department is not currently working. So we're looking at some alternatives such as off the shelf or potential joinery items that could be created to suit. Other things we're considering is the actual physical um, installation of it. So sizing the panels to allow for the installers to keep two meters apart. Does this maybe mean we need to have larger panels to allow one person to hold it while another is installing at the other end of the panel? Or is it the other way around? Maybe it needs to be smaller to so only one person can do it. Can something be hooked on or things like that? So they are items we're looking at alongside BAM and their supply chain. Oops. So we have actually recently been visiting site again for a while. We were not at site. So ourselves, AHR, the University Clerk Works are also attending site again. We as AHR have a dual role on this project. We're an innovated architect, so innovated to BAM. We're also a technical advisor for UE for their client side. So we're actually, there's two of us who, one in each role. However, the technical advisor is unable to attend in sight due to personal circumstances. So I'm actually doing site visits and trying to balance my two roles while I'm on site as an evaded architect and dealing with site queries and things like that for BAM, but also being there as the client side and technical advisor. So it's been an interesting challenge in that way. And it's trying to wear your diff two different hats and look at things side by side. One of the positives that come out of it is it has become the AHR cycle destination of choice for AHR. A number of my colleagues have used it as a place to go for a cycle ride and it's been nice and sunny for getting their break and their daily exercise. Especially with the hoarding being quite low on the site, it's quite easy to see and access with the cycle routes up to their UA campus. So looking to the future, Fortunately, there has been no client changes to the design as an impact of the COVID-19. And I think a lot of this is to do with the initial design of the building, as in there's a, a large amount of space per person, a lot more than in the current block the engineering department occupies. And the building has been designed to allow for reconfiguration, adaptability of layouts. So engineering is going to be changing. It's such a um, high technology uh, in um, industry that things are changing all the time so the faculty were really keen at the beginning that things could change and they could they could look to the future for things that were unknown and be able to teach 
as they change in the industry. So there's a lot of space in the rooms. There's a uh, scope for things to be changed as need be. And I think this is going to really help for it to be occupied as and when the university reopens. And that is everything. I'm going to stay on this picture because it's much more exciting to see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hera. That was really great. Um, a lot of content there. And I think the audience will really appreciate the amount of detail that you We've gone into covering how how the guys are you know being able to continue working on site and what you've had to adapt to in terms of uh, design and uh, carrying on with your role um in terms of role actually i thought it was really interesting to hear you say that you've not only you know before covid had this kind of dual wearing of hats both ta um and sitting on the, the contractor side um that's always a difficult one in anyway isn't it so i guess you have to put this kind of chinese wall up but um i i think with regards to the situation uh, that we find ourselves in, are both contractor and client okay with you, uh, you know, adopting both those roles through one person and are they being, you know, fairly, fairly okay about that? Uh, I think it should be for, well, there was, there's two of us who are undertaking the role. So we, it's a separate role each, uh, which is happening before the COVID-19. And we've actually have a slightly different approach and we don't actually have a Chinese wall about it. It is something that both the contractor and the client are aware that we do talk about things and we find it helps to speed up the process and makes it it's very transparent process then as well. And it does benefit all parties. But since the since the lockdown and one of us is visiting site, I am just undertaking the site visit. So I am reporting back and then discussing it with the TA. He's fulfilling the rest of his role as what he needs to do for the client side. And both parties are aware of it and they are happy to go along with that as well. As it does, it does benefit it. It's it's about awareness and knowing what's going on in the building. Oh, fantastic. I think that's really positive. Um, it uh, by the way, just noticing that we haven't got any questions that have come in through the audience just yet. So uh, just to remind you, there is a QA. and a You can put your uh, questions forward, but otherwise I'll just continue myself. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned about materials and having to look at a possible off-site um, well, off-the-shelf alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, has this been quite difficult to deal with as well in terms of your time? I guess, in having to look at, you know, potential multiple different scenarios when you probably would have drawn a line under, in the sand. Dare I say change control, but I suppose um, uh, it's probably worth mentioning. There is some of it that I would say falls under the idea of it being X as a design and build contract. So being the innovated architect, we have a role to fulfill with the contractor on that side and that things can uh, change. It may not be, but that would be with an equivalent pro product. So I suppose when we are looking at something that's different, yes, um, yes, maybe it does a bit more time consuming, but then these are a bit different circumstances, not something yes. you anticipated to come across in the project. So it is for the dare I say it, the greater good of the project, you're trying to find something that's mm. going to work and look and be similar and performance aesthetics to what you have. So it is in our benefit as well as then the clients for us to spend that time and trying to find a suitable alternative product. So yes, it maybe is a bit more time consuming, but I think if it means we get to have a great building at the end of it, it's worth it to, com to commit that time. Yeah, I, c I can agree more. Um, and I think I'll probably ask one other question, um, which is, uh, well, I've probably got two. Um, uh, so the 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 space internally, so mm -hmm. it's really uh, reconfigurable and it's really flexible and you know very dynamic. Um, was this the ambition of the university client itself, and did you look to global presidents or other universities or engineering spaces to kind of set that scene and that tone of what you wanted the building to look and feel like? Yeah, we spent uh, quite a while with the client talking about different precedents and we actually visited um, a couple of other universities, one of which was of particular interest to the client. But we also looked to the industry as well, particularly to things. Um, there were some European precedents as well of, of industry. And you think of things like especially automotive, where you get there almost showrooms in their factories. And it was trying to recreate some of that idea about the process of engineering being at the forefront. It's not just the end result, it's what's happening along the way. So it's about this visibility of it and what they had there for them. 
and things we have in the building as well is it's not just about how people use it it's allowing for potential for future services and things like that so the actual structure in the building is being designed so around that central atrium space um, there's areas where the slab can be more easier, uh, more easier, that wasn't good English, um, it is easier to break out this slab so to allow different services to come through at a later date, so to be able to change what that's going to be in there rather than having to break out larger amounts of the envelope. Yeah, I think you've really picked up that process and that fusion of um, bringing together both the academic and professional worlds and I can mm. imagine for UB students this is going to be a really fantastic plastic, a fantastic place for them to learn it's a really mm. inspiring environment um, so I mean I haven't do I have any questions in the Q&A um, oh interesting okay so somebody's asked how does the design address the concern of noise traveling between the levels through the atrium Okay, so there's a large amount of uh, acoustic absorption in the space is one of the things we looked at and, and the acoustic absorption has also been based on the potential activities that are happening in the area. So in the lower part of the atrium is where you would expect people to do more things like uh, more testing, more making, maybe where you do models and things like that. Um, so that's maybe a bit noisier. So there's a larger amount of absorption. And then we've also got, as you go up each level, there it becomes softer, you've got carpet, it's maybe more things where you'll have smaller groups as well. Um, but there's things like solid balustrades. So when you're actually sitting down, they will provide some physical blocking of the sound in those spaces. And as you and it, because it's staggered, the sound is also having to travel further as it goes up on that space and you've got the extra absorption as it goes up through. I was going to say, I think uh, you guys have got really good experience uh, from having designed the UK Hydrographic mm -hmm. Office, which we know uh, performs really well. Uh, we've got another question. Um, so David Wilson from David Wilson Partnership has asked the question of, have the COVID-19 working practices impacted on program and cost and how will the contractor be dealing with this? I know you've picked up a, um, some elements of that already. OK, uh, so at the moment, it's still a bit fluid, some of the program implications, and it is something that BAM are looking at with their um, subcontractors at the moment. And part of the reason I say it's fluid is because some of it's unknown. We don't know necessarily when people are, are going to be fully come back or they can f fully commit to supply dates and things like that and about also getting the amount of personnel on site. Um, it's not saying I can give a date or a number to at the moment about that, about any potential delay on site. Thank you. Well, I think Hira, I think that is it um, from your presentation today. So I, I can't thank you enough for coming on and talking to us about this brilliant project. It was a really wonderful presentation. I think we've been very lucky to hear of two incredible but very different projects, just a stone's throw away from each other yeah. at uh, University of West of England, Bristol. Um, uh, from all of us we wish you on your practice the best of luck in completing this project and thank uh, you I, no doubt the students and everyone else in Bristol will be chomping at the bit to go in and um, and see what it's like to be in that space thank you very much um, so everyone we're coming to a close and I just want to leave you with a few outro messages um, you know we understand that some people are facing some difficult times at the moment so please take a look at the COVID guidance pages on architecture Com, which is the RIBA website. We are officially in Mental Health Week uh, running from the 18th to 22nd of May and um, I also wanted to remind you of the support you can also gain from the Architects Benevolent Society um, who have also launched £75,000 uh, emergency coronavirus appeal so they're actually asking for do donations to help support the wider architectural community and their families through the coronavirus so if you would like to donate to that campaign Pain, you know, please can you visit the website which we're going to put in the Q&A um, in a moment. And in terms of events coming up, uh, please look out for the RIBA Practice Clinic, which is actually today at 4 p.m. Um, and this will be covering how to promote and market your business. So that's a really good one for small practices. And in the region, uh, RIBA Gloucestershire are actually hosting um, 
a talk with Amin Taha today at 6 p.m. However, that is sold out. Um, but we do have a brand new event which was released today, which is a global talk, um, and that will be on June the 5th, and it will be called Emerging as Resilient Post Lockdown, and that will be presented by Ken Wei of IDAS in Shanghai. And I will be, of course, uh, back next Tuesday at 1 p.m. on the 26th of May for our last talk of this series where we will welcome Tony Mullins from Oxford Architects. So finally, thank you again, Hera from AHR, um, and thank you, the audience, for joining us. I hope you can join me next week. Have a great afternoon and please stay safe over the bank holiday weekend. Thank you for listening.